Um, and in, in each case, there are specific questions I would hope we'd be asking um, of the uh, applicant. When in our discussions today, should we talk about that? <laughs> I think that could that could be right up front because I have to say I, I agree. They both got low marks from me on completeness of proposal submission um, because I had so many questions. Uh, probably, I, I probably should have rated Obear a little higher, but I just gave them both, you know, Ds on that. Um, it just seemed like there's important things missing from both. And I, 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 maybe an interview is the right thing to do. Um, and maybe the thing we want to end today with is a, some <coughs> consensus on whether we should just have them in for an interview, give them each, you know, talk to them each for about 15 minutes or something, <coughs> uh, have our questions. I have a few questions written down already um, and chatted with Brian about some of them as well. So that's, I think your, your point's really good, Donna. If I could add to that and second that motion that I found pretty gaping flaws in both proposals. And uh, initially I was sort of seduced by, uh, what's her name? Siren uh, Gilamini, a slick uh, presentation and very detailed um, in many ways, which was encouraging and historically very involved, which was also good, but they had other weaknesses. And after after a few hours of looking at these things, uh, Aubert started to appeal to me more, much to my surprise, but not appeal to me enough that I would go with them without interviewing them. So I, I would seriously recommend we interview both parties. Uh, the only alternative to that might be to put it out for more proposals. But I think given that we want to get going on this, we should uh, invite them in for an interview. I, I would certainly like to keep the idea of putting this out for more proposals on the table because ultimately private ownership of this property benefiting only the residents is it's it's not very high on the list of what the town expressed interest in I, I understand there's practicalities for why it's what people keep coming back to but that concept in and of itself is flawed. Yeah, I just, but, but Jen, I think one thing to keep in mind is that we did put this out without the idea of private ownership and nobody responded. There is nobody interested in renting it. So the only time we've gotten any responses or if we sell the building, to the person, no one's willing to invest in it without having the right of ownership. Okay, I, that's I, that that's that is a a bottom line that it took me a year and a half to get to, and I used I felt very similar to the way you're expressing right now. But that this is just that that's just what what is true. That's just a fact, and if. We're not willing to go with private ownership of the building. We should disband the committee and keep paying however many thousand dollars a year we're paying for it to decay in front of our eyes. I, uh, 4,600 a year. <laughs> but um, I agree with Joyce. And I speak in this case, not just uh, on my own behalf, but on the behalf of the historical commission, the town, is putting no money into this building. Certainly not a dollar has been put in for at least 20 years, and only a few dollars have been put in since 1991. And we have no, although the 
and the ad change. hoc committee, may I finish? Yeah. Although the ad hoc committee floated several sort of appealing ideas, no one has come forward to take the lead to uh, find a project, to lead a project that would both occupy the building and I actually think, and have up to a million and a half in rehab and stabilization money. I, I think despite the fact that Sear and Guillermini's budget has you know, 500,000 extra in fees for various people, probably including themselves, which is completely appropriate, it's, it's a building that has enormous challenges and we're, we have no appetite in this tiny town for saving it. And we, it's been unoccupied for five years and no angel, you know, we're not gonna have a magical solution to it. So I'm very much in favor of finding, not arguing against an abstract notion of what would the best possible solution be for the building, but what is the best real answer that we can have? And, and to me, Hello. Question now is, are either of these two proposals okay. potentially a real answer? Can we, uh, can we talk later? I'm in a Zoom meeting right now. I agree with um, okay. Donna's notion and Joyce's notion. I wish there was more proposals put yeah, forth. I'm away. not thrilled by either one of them. Um, I think it's unfair. They've already laid their cards on the table to cast a wider net for more proposals. They've already set the bar where it's at. So to have 10 more proposals to come in they're fighting against, they've already put it out there. Um, although I wish there was more to pick from. I personally think that the Sear Jalalmini proposal told us, they painted a pretty picture of what we wanted to hear about preserving a building and the historical aspect of it, what we're gonna fix and all these experts. And I saw it as they wanted to extract as much capital or CPA funds out of us, not put any of their money into it mm. and make huge consulting and engineering fees. But also I think they drastically underestimated what it's gonna cost to fix that building. And especially if they, they float the idea of a public civic use, then it becomes handicap accessible and all of that. And they don't talk about that. They just say eventually it'll end up being a private residence. So using tax dollars, to fix the whole structure, they're going to sell, make a profit on. Mr. Robert, yeah. I think he's underestimated. He's not going to do as good of a job in the restoration. Clearly, the other people are very, very talented. and They have a lot of experience. Mr. Robert is using his dollars, and he's trying to fix it up and make it look right. It's going to be close. It's not going to be. I don't think with his budget, he's going to make it as a historical as maybe the town would want. But his timeline is more realistic. And he's up front. This is my dollars. This is what I've got to spend. He shows his money. The other people completely omitted in their application, their funding, all of it. They just say we're using CPA funds. Yeah. Either, so. Neither proposal has a proper sources and uses of funds presentation. Um, Brian knows I, I talked with uh, someone at the Massachusetts Historical Commission. I wanted to talk about historic tax credits because yep. either of them talks about that. And um, that's potentially 40% off, 40% <laughs> credit. Um, yep. Aubert has 10 projects in the hopper with the Mass Historical Commission. He's gotten his tax credits approved for the Blue School, which we know about because the, we, the Historical Commission, helped him with that application. He did his work in Turner's Falls, which is actually very pretty. The power is built. It's a really nicely done building with tax credits. But I, I heard the same things that I think we would say is presentations are careless, you know, maybe a little sloppy. He doesn't dot all the I's and, and cross. He's the a builder like me. He's not an architect. You got to cut well, the guy a little slack in that respect. Yeah. Well, he's, he's a professional he's, architecture firm putting together proposals versus a builder. He's got a lot of irons in the fire. He, he probably doesn't doesn't hire the people who he could hire to help him with his applications. But my point is really, he does know how you put these things together. Mm -hmm. um, yep. And um, 
Oh, I'm, I, I, I don't, I want it to be clear. I'm not knocking his ability to be a builder, his talent, his skill, whatever. I have I'm not judging that no. at all. Just the historical preservation aspect of stuff. The other people, they clearly documented. They're very skilled in, in managing those types of projects. Yeah, but they're, they, the, I don't know if it was an elephant in the room or something, but I, I was not impressed at all with the Sear and Gellarmini one. I mean, they, like somebody said, oh yeah, they talk all about this public use and they don't have any idea. No, right? they don't. And the only thing they actually present are putting in two condos. It's so I have to assume they're not going to do any, they're going to see how much CPA money they can get to do something. Then they're going to flip the place with two condos on it. The, 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 the yeah. project, two projects that they um, present as having completed in the back bay. Yeah. And they never say specifically what their role was in the project. And these are big. Yeah, that's um, a little big. I agree. In one of them, the con the less the least expensive condominium sold for four and a half million, and in the other one, the least expensive sold for over eighteen million. So my uh, Brian's laughing. <laughs> no, I, I and yes, I don't think they have a clue that our entire CPA budget is about to reach two hundred thousand in a year, and it. That's not going to solve, solve their problems. So they're, and sorry, since I'm ranting and raving, the other thing that drove me crazy was their timeline. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it was as though they had all the key words that they picked out of the RFP and they were going to get every single one of them in there. What in the world could it mean that they would do the exterior renovation, put a maker space or a community center in the building for a year while they do the inter interior renovation and then it would be condominiums look, look at that timeline mm -hmm. that's exactly what it says yeah yeah the, the makers are going to be doing drywall i think I mean, you know. <laughs> the makers you come on in you think you're going to make something and they, they show you how to put up drywall there you go that's i i was not impressed if i had to decide today i would go with what um uh, I might call the, the devil we know, uh, which is Obear, which isn't, he's not really a devil. I mean, he's, uh, he, he's dealt with us openly in the past. I, you know, I don't have any problems with, I, I know he had lots of trouble, lots of delays on the blue school. And, and I'm sure his timeline is really optimistic here. Um, but there was enough left out of Obear's um, that I would definitely want to uh, have him and ask him some questions. And we, we did that with the blue school. When, uh, when that was uh, happening. So in fairness, I would invite the other folks in, but I I can't possibly see these other people. So, I mean, they'll, they'll just get out of town when the 90 days are up and they realize they can't. Yeah, I had a real problem. That way they want with the CPA money. After they do all their analysis, they can back out after 90 days. Then we have to go through this whole process all over again. Oh, yeah. I have a concern that both of these projects, though, create higher end housing. And I'm, I don't think that's what the town needs. I would rather, if, if we feel like it has to be private ownership, can we look towards creating housing that doesn't have to be so big. One of the challenges, and I don't know the details, but one of the challenges is that although the state has launched several good new programs to help fund affordable housing, this building was too small to meet the, to, to be eligible for, for support. And Sylvie may know more about what I'm just saying, because I'm saying that secondhand. Um, but, or Brian, but that is that is my impression. I mean, it's a 4,000 square foot building. It's, you know, there are houses on Masterson Hill that are bigger than that. Yeah. Right, but that's, but, you know, that, that there, are, there are people that's their job to go build buildings from scratch and they can build them 
whatever size they want, but why does the town have to feed that? Well, we're not building from scratch. They're renovating an existing building, and that's really important because nobody wants to put a torch to it and demolish it and then build from scratch. Okay, I, that's I, not on the table. Well, and it's um, not I, because of this because the town this the plot is so non-conforming. <laughs> you know? Yeah. There's no garage, there's no carport, there's no decks, there's no porches. You can't do anything to the outside of the building. Um, and what happens? So say we decide we're going to sell it to Mr. Obear. Once he has ownership of the building, he can do with it whatever he wants. And, and he's very he much about that. He can't. And well, he made that well, pretty clear, though. Me. He talked about he, mm -hmm. he did he did put in his RFP the right to change. Yep. He he did not make any promises about keeping the historic nature. He specifically said he would make modifications according to market needs, market trends. I think the historic in stuff is, the is in there. He can't change the outside. It's just the inside he can change, right? Right. right. If he right. And, and he could not, and just to repeat, he understands the tax credits. Mm -hmm. he, he will not be able to get historic rehabilitation tax credits if he doesn't take that seriously. And mm -hmm. what I, what um, he probably knows is the fact that this building is already in an, uh, an historic district and would have a preservation restriction on it would cut months, if not years off the application. It, it would sort of vault him through the application process, which took him, Brian, two to three years for the Blue School, right? To qualify yeah, for, the, for, for those tax credits. I mean, that's really important if you spend a million dollars and you're gonna get 400,000 back. Oh, that's, yeah. These are serious credits. I, I, I guess my point was, and I'm not, we're going to convey this building to either one of them. And the stipulation is they have to keep the outside his, historical, but the inside, once once they get it, it it's their, their decision to decide what happens. We have no more oversight. The town has no, no more oversight if they decide to apply for a zoning permit for a mixed use for any of the other uses or two family, one family, it doesn't matter. It's their property. Is that my, is that correct? Yeah, whatever the zoning would allow. So yeah. someone yeah. wants to, if Mr. Obeer decides I wanna have a home-based business and I'm gonna make popsicle sticks, he can do that there. Anything that, that is consistent with the zoning. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, they, and, and so, so, the, that, so, so the insight those are the things matter. we have is the historic exterior and we've yeah. got the zoning of the land. So the inside um, of the building and the use inside doesn't really matter to us because they can do whatever they want. Well, just, there's, 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 there's the outside. Yeah. With what? There's some limitations because it's in AR one, and you know it's the. I, I understand that. I I understand what you're saying there, but what their use of the inside is, as long as it conforms with our zoning laws and planning rules, they can do whatever they want once they own the property. Is that correct or is that not correct? Mm -hmm. My understanding is you're correct, and Brian's not. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we're arguing semantics over one family, two family, all that stuff because it doesn't matter. Yeah. We can cast a wider net, interview them, see what we want to do. I wish we had ten more proposals. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm not at the point where I'd want to throw out both of these proposals and say, let's start all over again and send that RFP out and maybe amend it to say, we're looking for low-income housing or something, which mm -hmm. is probably not very realistic. <laughs> but um, I'm not ready to throw them out. I don't um, think that is going to solve for that. I one. would like to ask some more questions, though, and I think, okay. I, think uh, I don't know if we schedule um, maybe some back-to-back -back interviews. Um, maybe have them for 15 minutes, give ourselves a few minutes to discuss, go to the next one, have an interview. We could do all that within about an hour, I would think. Can we have a list of questions we're going to ask and all decide on them ahead of time? 
do we give it yeah. to them to prepare ahead of time so they can have a response for us, but we get them blindsided with it? Um, I think we give them, uh, we just went through a big interview process here. It okay. went so much better for having given the questions in advance. It doesn't mean we can't ask things that occur to us at the moment as well, but uh, having those. Please. Can we send them to them as an email request for more information and have them respond to it? And then we can meet and decide if we want to ask any further questions. I, I mean, think we can drag them all the way to Waitley for a meeting. Oh, no, they, they, they can just zoom. respond. They zoom. can zoom to a meeting. Okay. They, can, they could zoom to an interview. That, that would be, um, okay. I think that would be, that would be fine. Um, because it's really, we're asking for clarifications on, the document they've already given us. Mm -hmm. That's um, reasonable. Yeah. So yeah, I, I wouldn't want them to have to drive all the way out. <laughs> um, do we need to decide as a group what the questions are, or do we do do we need to decide as a group what the questions are? <laughs> If we if we can, I think that would would, would be good. Um, okay. And to the extent we can ask the same questions to each party, the okay. better. Do right. we each, do we each give our questions to Brian, a handful of questions that we have, and let him combine um, them? Yeah, and he could. Yeah, that might be good to have one person, whether it's Brian or, or one of us, just be the point person for questions. Um, I was just going to say, I'll make a Google Doc and share it with everybody <laughs> and enter your own questions. But maybe it's better to um, have a, a person as the intermediary to take the question that I'm going to ask and the one Paul's going to ask with very similar content and just mm -hmm. make it one question. Okay. Yeah. If you want to send it to me, that's fine. Okay. Okay. And when do you want them? Um, what's reasonable next Monday? Monday. Monday. <laughs> Monday. Oh, okay. okay. And then the intent will be that I would uh, I'll I'll pull those together and then send those questions out to them with a request for an interview. Yeah. I thought JD was suggesting written responses. Was I mis did I misunderstand? I don't know. Well, I would, I would say both, to maybe. Start, to yeah. start, and we decide if we want to follow up with written. I mean, with personal. Oh. That's what I heard J.D. say. Yeah, I, I think that's too many too many rounds. Too many so many. here's our questions. Come and talk to us at this interview. So they don't have to go preparing another document. Okay. They can just show up. That's fair. Give us answers. We can follow up if... We don't understand their answers and just do all that in real time. It's, it's going to get to be too much effort on everybody's part. We'll okay. Keep it, keep it. I think we should just keep it simple. The meeting's recorded, right? So it's, there's no issues of documenting what they say. So, mm -hmm, yeah. Okay. I'm good with that. And uh, I'll coordinate the, the meeting time, the meeting date. I'll call it works. Okay. I'll email out some potential dates, dates and times. Sound good? Okay. Um, just for full disclosure, I met Mr. Obear at the Franklin County Technical School. We're both on an advisory committee for students because I have tech school students that work for me and he does too. And I've met him for the first time. Like. I don't know, in October or November or something. He seemed like a nice guy, but that's the first, only time I've ever met him. And we meet well, like twice a year or something. Actually, lots of people have met him because he's met with the planning board and the ZBA. Okay. He's, he's, I he's, never he's, met him before, but he, he was a nice guy. Yeah. We made small talk. He's a nice guy. Yeah. And, I, and I'm sure the other folks are nice people too, I'm sure. And I, yeah, and I, I've met Mr. O'Bear as well from the Blue School. Yeah. yeah. Um, Paul's muted. Paul, are you muted? Because I can't hear you. 
Yeah. Yeah. You seem to be muted. Your the mute sign is on. Yeah. There you go. One more. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I I was just wondering about checking the references. Have we checked their references? Oh, I didn't make any phone calls to anybody. No. Yeah, I didn't either. Should we? I think I, I, perhaps I don't have time to. The, the architects firm, it's like was mentioned earlier, they didn't really say what they did right, on their projects. They said people they worked with, and one of the guys who had a long list of buildings he'd worked on, basically he'd done, he consulted on masonry for most of them. So I think checking their references means understanding what they've yeah. actually Right. Well, well I, I have a, an even larger meta question, I think, and that is, who are they? I mean, is this an LLC? What kind of company is it? Is it a company? It seems like an assortment of individuals who have various experiences and have their own companies and occasionally maybe they collaborate with these two architects, but it's not clear to me. Well, are the they general contractors or the architects? The applicants are the architects. Well, they are right. architects. architects. They are architects, but we don't actually know if that's their role because they also presented a long CV from an historic preservation architect. And most of the experience that was listed was his. So, I mean, you can right. be an architect guy. and be functioning as a developer. <laughs> yes. when it, when it, but who's the general contractor? They didn't. I, yeah. I read it as the architects were putting in the proposal, and here's a bunch of people we've worked with, okay. including the, when the window guys. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, that sounds like there's the basis of some questions to ask mm -hmm. in an interview because I think everybody is familiar with that. And it might be that we check the references after the interviews when we know a little bit more. We might know better questions to ask the their references. I mean, I'm, a, I'm a general contractor and I'm 100% different than an architect. Totally different <laughs> business. <laughs> yeah. are, we, are we allowed to ask, I, I mean, I, on the financial side, I know that we're allowed to ask for much more detail about what are you going to spend on this project and how are you going to fund it? What are the sources? And neither of them gave us that. But are we allowed to ask, how are you proposing to make money on this project? Because they're not philanthropists. You know, they're not giving them. And, and in neither case could I really make the math work about the benefit to that. Um, are we allowed to ask what, what Obear said, I realized at first I thought that he was saying that he would sell the single family house for 550 or 570 number like that. And then I realized that what he was doing or what someone helped him do was track to our assessed values and make an assumption because he, I mean, little capes on Chestnut Plain Road are selling for more than that now. So that yeah. was, you know, that doesn't, didn't make any sense. I mean, yeah, um, I thought that number was low too. Yeah, that what is your what is your plan for the building? Because well, I mean, I I really think it's important that we do not sell this building unless we are quite confident that the buyer has the resources and a plan to follow through and do what he says he's going to do. Um, Didn't Obear offer something indicating a million dollar fund available or something? Yeah. Yeah, he did. Okay. He, he had a he had a, a letter from a banker that expired on December 31st. And I decided not to worry too much about that because maybe that's just the way the banks write letters. Mm -hmm. Well, it is. <laughs> no. And then proposals were due December 13th. So right, right, right. it was in that time frame. It was still valid right. when it was due. Right. Yeah. Um, but but saying he could borrow a million dollars doesn't answer the second half that of the I question. Agree. <laughs> no. Do we know yeah. the answer to Donna's question? We don't know anything but what it's really yeah. nice. Well, no, it, but it sounds, it sounds like we all have a lot of uh, a lot of good basic questions 
that we can put in to an email to uh, to Brian before Monday. Um, and I really I, I like I like the composition of the committee, honestly, because different of, of us had different kinds of questions. And I'm especially grateful that Donna is here too, because I think you put it very nicely. We, you know, one reason to not sell to either of them would be if we think they're just going to get in there and get over their heads and not be able to get out, right? We don't need something abandoned in the middle of town. It's kind of what we have right now, um, although we haven't really abandoned it. Um, so I'm really grateful that, <laughs> that Donna's going to write up those questions. And Jenny's got really good questions about um, the like the roles that these people have played in, in other uh, projects. And I think we're going to have a good set of questions but I'm wondering if we can wrap up so that um, uh, JD can get uh, onto his <laughs> next appointment. Yes. Um, and since since I think we basically uh, have a plan for moving forward. Yeah, when when Brian started, he said we were going to do the scoring. Are we just going to table that until um, we get the answers? And I we feel need like I can't thing? score these unless I have some answers. <laughs> do we make a motion to proceed on that path? Do we have to do that or no? Do we need it? I don't think we necessarily need it. Okay. Could we, could we have uh, the questions due at the end of the day on Monday? Yeah. That sure. would be good. Okay. okay. End of the day Monday then. Perfect. Do we want to, is there a sense of trying to limiting the questions or unlimited questions? Like, do we want to try to give them like eight or 10 questions or are we trying to give them 50 questions? Does that matter? Oh, oh. 50. Not 50. Not 50. <laughs> so do we each want to come up with like three or four really important or five yeah. points? I was thinking I, I would come ones. up with one or one or two questions because I know Donna's okay. going to cover the financial one and you're okay. going to cover something that I hadn't even thought of. Okay. Um, and, and and Jenny too, she'll think of something I hadn't thought of. So um, do, I might do, think George, do we want to divide and conquer then have someone to handle the financial ones, some handle the use ones, I could handle the building ones so we don't have a lot of, kind yeah. of the same questions and then and, and then if there is overlap brian will catch it and and uh, i can of certainly take over together. some of the technical building aspect questions i can certainly do that that's my expertise yeah yeah i think if we okay. we'd kind of stick to either our expertise or our interest um okay that's um i think that's usually where the best kind of questions come from and, okay. and i I recommend that we give Brian full authority to decide when several of us have submitted questions that are similar enough that he can just pick a line. I think one set of questions. Yeah, I think yeah, one set of questions, and and I trust Brian's judgment on that, as I do weekly. <laughs> okay. Is that it? Okay. So to understand this, we're gonna we're gonna submit to Brian questions. Mm -hmm. And I think we we can stick to whatever aspects of the project we think we're best at. But I think if we have like I might have a question about the financing as well as a question about the mm -hmm. neighborhood impacts. Yeah, so sure. I'd like to not be cubby told into sure. yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. And the, our questions are to each one. We're not doing one set of questions that both applicants get. Is that right? Correct. Correct. Okay. It wouldn't make sense otherwise. Yeah. They're both answering the same question, not separate questions. Is that great? Right? No. Uh, no, I think the questions I have for Aubert are different from the questions I have for Sear and Joe. Okay. So we're we're gonna ask Aubert a certain set and the other people a different set. Right, because they have okay. they have different proposals. So okay. I'm clear are... on that now. Okay. Yeah, although some of them may be similar, but I, I yeah. think. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Sounds good. All right. I've got to go, guys. Okay. Goodbye. Thank you. Okay. Bye bye. All right. I think the um, rest of us are ready to adjourn, too. I'm ready. All right. All right. Now everybody knows what your homework is. You got homework due Monday, end of the day. Do I sound teachery? Sorry. <laughs> Oh. <laughs>
Yes, Joyce, your pedagogy was excellent. I like the way you uh, you applauded everybody's contribution and made them feel uh, accepted and part of the discussion. That was very effective. I don't know. I was skeptical. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. All right. Thanks. Bye. Good night, everybody. Thanks for coming, Sylvie.